I'm going to talk about globalization and I'm going to pick out one or two things which are important for African smallholders on the way through. So three areas of globalization and the first one is that trade technology and culture. So we all know that globalization is about freer movement of goods, services, capital, foreign direct investment, probably a little bit less freer movement of people for well-known reasons. This brings opportunities to African smallholders, the chance to export goods to markets where prices may be at a premium. It brings the benefits of more stable food prices and less extremes that have been seen in local markets which have done so much to imperil food security. It does require that supply chains are capable of exporting. Now, that's very different for, from one smallholder to another. I'm particularly interested at the moment on a sesame boom which has been seen in Rukwa district of southwest Tanzania. The demands for exporting from Rukwa district in sesame are very small because the sesame gets processed. It gets crushed into oil uh, somewhere along the supply chain on the way to India. Not so for fresh produce. And those of you who know the travails of smallholders producing pineapples in Ghana or tomatoes in Senegal will know that it's not easy to meet export standards for smallholders. But here's the dream. Here's the dream of what globalized trade might mean for African smallholders. There are a lot of small countries in Africa. One country I know and rather like, New Zealand. Why haven't we got an African New Zealand? Why haven't we got a small country in Africa with lots of verdant resources, which has terrific agricultural exports? And here's a country that I hope I will see do this before I die, Sierra Leone. Rice, fish, palm oil to Nigeria. Why not? Why not? Um, looking at technology, technology itself is an aspect of globalization with all the communications, changes, mobiles, internet, broadcasting. But it's also about technology which now crosses frontiers more easily than in the past. And it's about technologies which have become very much cheaper. Now, looking at this from the point of view of an African smallholder, yes, the mobiles are there, but those of us who are researchers, what we are reading in the papers, in, in the academic papers, is that African smallholders treat those mobiles the same way that we treat our mobiles. They're social devices, first and foremost, for work purposes, secondary. And what may be more important on the technology front and the hidden bit are uh, very simple technologies, cheap pumps for irrigation, two-wheel tractors, solar arrays. These are probably making more of a difference in rural Africa than the much heralded ag tech, industry four, and so on, which will be coming in the future, the robotics, the nanotechnology, and so on. But right now, it's the cheaper technology which is making the difference, and making more of a difference than some people think. The last of the first things here is, is culture. And advertising and media is bringing cultural change, which for those of us interested in food and nutrition, means worsening diets. This isn't something we expected, but it is what is happening. The epidemic of obesity, which is sweeping the developing world, with its concomitants in diabetes, coronary disease, cancers, and so on. Whoops. A second area that I won't talk about because everybody else is talking about it, but it is part of globalization, and it's the internationalization of environmental problems. Climate change, as Dr. Garber has just talked about, pollution, loss of biodiversity, and so on. Massive challenges uh, that they present for us. Now, the third area that one can pick out here 
uh, the consequences of globalization for politics. And this plays out at two levels. One is changes in power, shifts in power, in which one can see increased power for multinational corporations, with the possibility that some of those corporations ally with local elites to grab resources which may affect smallholder farmers, something we were very worried about from 2008 onwards with the land grabs. It does mean the, move, the, the freer exchange of ideas for social movements, and it probably means less control for nation states. How far that goes is something to be discussed. The other side of this is ideas and ideals which change with globalization. And here one can be optimistic that globalization means that some thoroughly bad ideas in policy are not really possible anymore once you've got the information. So one thinks of the bad old days in Africa of the 1970s and 1980s when we had negative protection, very high effective rates of many smallholder farmers. Is that possible now? Probably not. On the other hand, we are very much aware of what may happen with international waves of populist rhetoric and facile ideas which seem to move more easily with social media than we had expected. Uh, so that's something that may play out to the advantage or the disadvantage of smallholder farmers. Now, looking at that particular panorama, Carr asked me to say, what are the challenges here for government, civil society, private enterprise, and so on. Uh, I don't think it's particularly productive to divide it that way. Let's just say, uh, let's just pick out three big challenges which are there for all actors that are in that space. One of those comes from trade, and it's the usual challenge which we face in agricultural development of competitive supply chains. And what are competitive supply chains? Here's the bad news. Competitive supply chains is about farming and making money out of farming while prices go in real terms ever less and whilst the standards and demands on farmers become ever higher. It is possible to meet that challenge. Farmers have been doing it for 60 years, but it's not easy. A second challenge that we've got in there is that of steering cultures away from bad diets. I'm particularly interested in obesity. We do not know how to stop it, and we have to find a way of doing that. Uh, the good news on that is we haven't tried hard enough yet, and when we try harder, we may actually get the dietary change. And the third area I would, uh, I would pick out here, of course, is the huge green agenda of governing natural resources. And from the point of view of the smallholder, how can we reward people for uh, conservation of their land? How can we reward people for the mitigation of climate change through capturing carbon on farming systems? I'm up to nine and a half minutes. I've got 25 seconds less left. Carr said, you're supposed to say something about what is the role of donors and what is the role of governments. And I think one just answers that with first principles. What should donors be doing? Providing funds where governments are short of funds, infrastructure, public health services. But most of all, what I would say to donors today, because I think this is particularly interesting for this conference, is donors should take risks where national governments fear to take risks. So it's pilots, innovations, working models, and trying those things that governments would like to do if they had the resources, but they can't risk it at the moment. Thank you.